There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Hymn number 198. if you will, to the New Testament portion that was read to us, the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel, and I focus your attention on verse 20 of this famous parable, perhaps the most famous of all those that our Lord Jesus Christ taught, the parable of the prodigal son, described by Charles Dickens as perhaps the best short story ever told. It's certainly a greatly loved parable spoken by the Lord Jesus. It's so full of the gospel. And I believe it's very appropriate for us to focus on this on the Lord's Day morning when we think about his dying love in the Lord's Supper. But I'm still, in a sense, continuing in a series that I began some weeks ago uh, looking at, in particular, the Lord Jesus Christ and various characteristics, attributes, if you like, about him. We have considered several, including um, the Lord's Supper itself, um, the Lord's Prayer, and then very recently, two uh, weeks ago, we were considering the Lord's tears that he wept over Jerusalem, of course, not to forget when he wept at the tomb of, of Lazarus. We then last time thought about the Lord's love. Now this morning we consider the Lord's compassion. Now you might say, what's the difference between his love and his compassion? Well, very simply, compassion is love in action. 
and uh, we may truly say that this story is an action story. It's full of action. It's full of love in evidence. And it's very appropriate, uh, appropriate for us to think about this uh, this morning. Because what are we doing when we celebrate the Holy Supper? We're focusing upon Calvary love. The cross reveals the Calvary love of God in Christ. I've also underlined the fact that whenever we think about God, we should think about him in thoroughly Trinitarian terms. He is God the Father, he is God the Son, and he is God the Holy Spirit. And whenever we use the name God, we should assume that Trinitarian understanding so that each of the three persons shall be given the worship that each of them are due. So vital and fundamental uh, this is. So we're thinking about this, uh, this wonderful story, although I'm not going to stay just with this section of scripture. I'll be branching out and bringing in many other important and relevant uh, scriptures. But I start, in a sense, uh, with a question. And it's a question which is driven by continuing concerns that I've had for several months. And as I look at the state of the church, from all the news that one's able to acquire uh, these, these days. The question I put is this. Are we thrilled and amazed at the gospel as we ought to be? Would you not agree? I'm sure you would. That because of the wonder of the gospel, the reality that it reveals to us about God, our need, and how he has remedied the problem that we face as a result of our need, uh, there is no better message, is there, in all human history. The greatest miracle of the universe is the love of God. We have the greatest story to share with the world. And uh, we ought, therefore, surely, to be thrilled and amazed at the gospel. But I rather suspect, and I think you will perhaps admit that uh, we share uh, in, in this problem, that there is crisis in the church. To go no further, certainly in this country, uh, the professing Church of Christ is not in a buoyant state, not in a confident state, not professing, uh, as far as we seem to be aware, that this is the greatest message in the world. This is the greatest truth that needs to be proclaimed and indeed to be trumpeted forth uh, all over the country and all over uh, the world. But I think there's a sense in which this was also an Ephesian crisis, by which I refer, of course, to the church to which the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians. It's a glorious, it's a mighty, truth-packed, um, emotion-driven uh, epistle. Next to Romans and Galatians, I suppose Ephesians is perhaps uh, the next most important of all the New Testament uh, letters. But there was a problem. You see, in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, he prayed that the Ephesians might know the length, the depth, and the height of the love of Christ, that Christ, that the love of Christ might fill their hearts. Now, we would assume that that should be normal Christian teaching and normal Christian experience. But um, why did the Apostle Paul so emphasize the importance of knowing and experiencing the love of Christ filling our hearts and lives. Well, the evidence seems to be that there was a problem, which was not peculiar to the church at Ephesus, but certainly has been a regular sad feature throughout Christian history. You only have to read Acts chapter 20 to see the way that before the Apostle Paul left Ephesus and left the Ephesian elders to whom he was speaking, he was on his way back to Jerusalem, but he warned them that from their own midst would false teachers arise, corrupting the faith. And he wept over them as he shared these things. And he's really sort of saying, I don't know whether this is uh, a, a direct prophecy or whether it's simply to expect this in the nature of things, that uh, they would be in difficulty. And then when you turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 4, the first of the seven letters to the churches, in which we see the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen and ascended Christ, 
speaking through the Apostle John, who received the revelation on the island of Patmos, sending these messages to the seven uh, churches. And the letter to the church in Ephesus is the first one. And uh, in uh, chapter 2, verse 4, he, he, in the whole of the epistle, he commends them for being uh, champions for truth, for being watchful for heretics and to deal with them. The Lord commends them for uh, being champions of orthodoxy, biblical orthodoxy. But he did say this in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have something against you. You have left your first love. By which we understand their love for the Lord Jesus had cooled. And when that happens, their love for one another would have cooled. And likewise, their love for the wider community would have cooled. That was a serious problem. So they, they ticked all the right boxes in many respects. But there's one glaring defect. They left their first love. Now, what's so tragic about that is that they virtually repeated the problem which was evident in the Old Testament. You see, the, the covenant people of God, the living God, the God of Israel, had made a covenant with his people. And that covenant was not just a covenant of righteousness, but it was a covenant of love, akin to a marriage contract, if you like. And several of the prophets allude to that. And it was a, a fundamental feature that the people of Israel were to say, well, we are the people of God and we've been redeemed by his grace. We've been delivered from, from e Egypt. And we've now been called to bear witness to the world. And of course, there was uh, undoubtedly an international anticipation, even in the Old Testament, that the Gentiles were going to come into the blessing of God's grace, the promise given to Abraham that in and through him and the Messiah who was to come, that in him all the families of the earth were to be blessed. But um, when you look at the history of the Old Testament, it is, it is so very, very sad. And uh, they played the prostitute. They rejected the wondrous covenant love which was fundamental to their relationship with God. In fact, we sang about it in our psalm, didn't we? Uh, he will not always chide, but mercy showing. His steadfast covenant love on us bestowing, he'll stay his wrath, the Lord is merciful. But how awful to discover, and this is, yes, there are wonderful things in the Old Testament, but lots of distressing things as well, particularly in this regard. And it seems to be the case from Revelation 2 verse 4 that the Ephesian Christians were falling into the same trap, that they left their first love. There was indeed a problem. And in Professor William Ramsay's uh, very authoritative study on the Letters to the Seven Churches, it was published in the early 20th century, uh, he identified the problem that they had lost their enthusiasm. He doesn't use the word love, he doesn't even quote the text, but that's the word he repeatedly uses in his commentary on that letter, that they had lost their enthusiasm. It's a rather flat, almost Victorian sort of expression, the way he handles it. But they'd lost their enthusiasm because they left their first love. And when we as Christians uh, love the Lord Jesus Christ and when we love the gospel, it's impossible for us not to be enthusiastic about sharing the gospel. Surely, I don't need to argue that at any great length, I don't uh, believe. Now, some of you will know that recently, Marion and myself, we celebrated our, our 53rd uh, wedding anniversary. And there's a great deal in the Bible about love and, and marriage, which is important for us all at certain st stages to be aware of. It's interesting that in the uh, book of Proverbs, in chapter 5, um, I am instructed there to be, uh, um, in, to, to be uh, enraptured with my wife's love. The authorised version uses a, a slightly different word, to be ravished with her love. 
Now, I can assure you I've had no problems whatsoever in the 53 years of obeying that uh, uh, description of, of, of Christian marriage. But I mention that because in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, the Apostle Paul there says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now the picture is very, very obvious. And the model of a husband's love to, to his wife is the love of Christ to his church. Such a total love, a sacrificial love, um, a miraculous, amazing love was the love with which the Lord Jesus loves his people and that he loves you and, and me. So I think we should really take these things to heart and say, well, if we are not as enthusiastic as we ought to be, why is that the case? A lot of it must come down to a lack of a, a clear understanding. A lot of it must come down to a lack of experience. Uh, Richard Baxter, in his comment on Revelation 2, he makes the point that the Ephesians were in the trouble that they were because of negligence. That applies to the Old Testament. Israel neglecting the God who loved them. The Ephesians neglecting the Saviour who loved them. And I think when you look at the problems of Christian history for 2,000 years, it's right down at the present time. The more I am informed about church life and so forth, despite all that's going on on all sorts of levels, I think this does indicate a, a, a problem. So how do we deal with this? How do we consider uh, this compassion of the Lord? The compassion that was exhibited in everything that the Lord Jesus Christ said and did, and not least in this wonderful parable of the prodigal son. Well, let's move on now to think about, firstly, the compassion in the cross. The compassion of God in Christ in the cross. I could have changed the preposition and say compassion on the cross because that's precisely how we should understand Calvary. That when we consider the sufferings of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ suffering there the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God that it was the compassion of God love in action which was there displayed in the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Father's love of God in Christ, in giving him to be our Saviour, in giving him to sacrifice for our sins upon the cross. And even in the parable, of course, uh, there is this emphasis on the compassion of God. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's gospel grace. That's compassion. There's even a hint, although I wouldn't press this too far, there's even a hint of the message of the cross in verse 23. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Well, what is this reminding us of? Well, it's reminding us of the gospel at its most simply stated. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're reminded too, are we not, in the Apostle John's first uh, epistle, that we have an advocate with the Father. He says in 1 John 2 verse 2, and that he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He's there reminding us that the sufferings of Jesus upon the cross were necessary to turn away from us the wrath of God. You see, our sins have provoked the holy God who made us, who cares for us, and who loves us. That's why sin is so serious. It's sinning against a God who loves us. When I sin, when you sin, we're sinning against a God who loves us. How ungrateful we are, as well as unholy we are. So we should think about the amazing remedy of the cross. It is the compassion of God. 
It's not surprising, therefore, and I've often said this, it's my second favourite text in the Scriptures, Galatians 2, verse 20, where the Apostle Paul says, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And I believe it was that love, love to Jesus, love from Jesus, that energised Paul in all his ministry and apostolic labours, uh, which we know of in the New Testament. And that's how it should be for us. So there was Paul writing to the Ephesians and urging them to experience this love for themselves in chapter 3. And to, to feel the power of, the, of this love in their married lives, in their family lives, uh, guided by, inspired by the love of Christ for his, his church. So what this should lead us to acknowledge is that what amazing grace uh, has saved us. What an amazing message. What an amazing God. What an amazing saviour we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I come back to my question. Is, is that how you feel? Do you feel the wonder of all this? Are you thrilled and amazed at the gospel? And I can't help but think that this nation of ours with teeming with problems, political problems, health problems, petrol problems, every other kind of problem, would this nation not be turned around if those who name the name of Christ were excited and enthused about what we profess to believe? I believe this really is, is the case. And to do so because um, the amazing grace of God is the only solution. There is no other way. Because the root cause of all the evils that we're suffering is because human beings are sinful. We are evil in nature. And but for the grace of God, what could life be like? Jesus so faithfully expose the evil of human nature and then he went on to call people to repentance and then to feel the blessing of the remedy of what he suffered for us in Calvary in satisfying the justice of God so that all those who believe the gospel will be delivered from God's wrath, delivered from hell which threatens all who reject the Lord Jesus Christ and to have the assurance of a blessed eternity uh, in, in heaven. What we're saying is that there's no other way. When we look at our sins, we remember uh, the words of the prophet Isaiah, that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. It's only when you come to that persuasion about yourself that then the message of the cross will appear more glorious. When you stop thinking that you can amend your life and commend yourself to God when you realise that that's utterly impossible and that the way to the Father is through the cross of the Son who loved us and who gave himself for us. There is no other religion or ideology. The multi-faith madness that we're, we're all awash with in our culture, that's no solution. The only solution is here. It's in him and in no other. And what we must declare is that this amazing grace is the only reality to deliver us from the wrath to come. Yes, I sp I'm speaking about the compassion of God, but we need the compassion because of his wrath. He is loving, but he's also holy. So we mustn't go with the flow of those who like to think about God as the God of love, and uh, he loves us unconditionally, which is true, but uh, that's all there is to it. It's, it isn't all there is to it. It's because of his holiness and his purity, which threatens us in our sinfulness. It's why we need the cross. And that's why we rejoice in the message of, of the cross. So that is the compassion in the cross, the compassion on the cross, which is set forth simply in the parable, but it's the message which fills the Bible Isaiah 53, it sounds like the New Testament, but it's the same one and only gospel that fills the whole of the scriptures from beginning to, to end. Which leads on secondly to consider compassion to the church, compassion to 
uh, the church. Now last week I had occasion to talk about the love of God, the love of God in Christ, and to see some important distinctions on this subject. There is a universal love of God for mankind. John 3.16 says so. There is a particular love of God in Christ for his church, for his, his people. There is, if you like, a general love of God. There is a special love of God. There is a love of God for the world. There is a love of God for his elect. The Bible is very clear about these things. And that's why we understand the true um, and original reformed view of the atonement, that the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he, in a very real sense, um, died for the sins of the world. But he died in a very special sense, for the sins of the elect and for his church. That's the application of what is universally available. That double understanding of the gospel. That certainly was the view uh, that John Calvin and other reformers taught in the, uh, in the 16th century. And it's when we come to the Lord's Supper that we are to be considering the special particular love of God to his, his people. And when we consider that, again, going back to my, to my question, do we feel the amazement and the wonder? Are we excited? Are we thrilled at what Christ has done for us? We, the undeserving, we who deserve hell to be banished from the holy presence of God for all eternity, that's what you and I deserve. And yet the cross is the way of deliverance, the way of salvation. And that surely, as we rejoice with gratitude in our deliverance from the wrath to come, well, there's something wrong with us, surely, uh, if we're not full of enthusiasm, and that our love for Jesus and our experience of his love for us should be kept warm, kept at least simmering in our souls, can I put it like that, Rather than through neglect, we become complacent and we take it all for granted and we grow cold. And it, it, it's tragic that we should ever get anywhere near that state. And yet so many of the pressures that we're living in today, and in every age for that matter, uh, they're all calculated to, to cool us off. So my dear brothers and sisters, that's what we should be thinking about at this uh, particular uh, time. We have so much, therefore... Now, hopping back for a second to, to Ephesians, Ephesians 1 starts off with the great glory of God in grace and salvation, in uh, calling us to salvation, where we learn about uh, divine election and God's predestination. But it's rather striking there that in that chapter, it's, it's more like a hymn of praise, in the words of the Apostle Paul, than uh, a theological dissertation on the sovereignty of God. And it's interesting that uh, John Calvin senses this in his sermons uh, on, on Ephesians. And uh, he, he says that when we think about election, we shouldn't give way to endless speculations about who the elect are and the decrees and so on. Uh, th that subject is there to humble us, to make us realize that we cannot and will not save ourselves. Therefore, with that hymn of praise, we ought to be amazed with this wondrous grace. Now, I have mentioned earlier, haven't I, this use of the word being ravished with the gospel. Well, let me share with you um, a quote from John Calvin from his sermons on Ephesians. And uh, this is what he says. He uses the word ravish that I referred to earlier in a different uh, context. This is what he says. How we ought to be, as it were, ravished. This is John Calvin now, right? He's often been blamed for, pre for inventing predestination, poor chap. Uh, and, 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 and many other things, as if he was a cold, um, uh, computer-like uh, creature who never felt anything. You know, all, all these lies still dog his steps, as it were. This is John Calvin. We ought to be, as it were, ravished when the gospel is preached because God there opens the things that were incomprehensible to all men before. 
and which no man would ever have believed or conceived, for he seemed to have chosen only the line of Abraham in such a way as if he had rejected all the rest of the world. Therefore it was a wonderful thing when he poured out his grace upon all men in common. Yet we know that when Jesus Christ came into the world, these very same people were wholly degenerate, and God's doctrine was so corrupted that there was nothing but superstition among the Jews. It seemed then that all was past hope of recovery when suddenly, beyond the expectation of all men, salvation was offered to all nations. Behold Christ who had before been hidden deep in obscurity and even in such deep obscurity that there was no hope that he should ever come out of it, rose up as the son of righteousness to give light to the world. Now, isn't that a, isn't that a thrilling quote? Uh, it comes from his sermons on Ephesians. And that's the way that this amazing grace gripped John Calvin. I wish it was always the case that those who call themselves Calvinists are similarly as emotional and thrilled and amazed as John Calvin is. But I submit to you that there's something wrong with us if we are not ravished with the gospel. So vital, so fundamental this is. Uh, so what is the problem we have to say to ourselves? Well, it must be that we don't hear enough about this gospel. We don't read our Bibles as frequently as or as prayerfully, or as spiritually as we ought. We're too easily distracted by other things. Perhaps there is a danger of reading too many other books and not the Bible enough. And so often our understanding can get foggy and misty. But if we focus upon biblical orthodoxy, we and, and love those who write books that reinforce biblical orthodoxy, then the problem will not exist. We'll be ravished by the gospel we'll be amazed at the compassion of God in Christ. And we will be different people. And certainly the church at her best, as at the beginning throughout her history, been running all over the world, gossiping the gospel, as Dr. Lloyd-Jones used to say about the early church. Whenever we get together, we chat about so many things, don't we? Football results. The weather. This, that and the other. Oh, that we would be so thrilled with the gospel that we can't s stop speaking about it. So this is compassion to the church, which, as Calvin made clear, should be such that we rejoice in it, we rest in it humbly, we trust the sovereign grace of God, but we don't keep it to ourselves. It overflows and must overflow to the world. That was exactly the problem with the Ephesian church. The they left their first love, and their love towards Jesus cooled. Their love for one another cooled. Their love for the wider community cooled. What a tragic thing. So how is your Christian life, my dear friends, this morning? Are you excited or thrilled? We have something to sing about. It's the only real message worth singing about, I do believe, as I often have said. Which brings me third and last. Compassion to the community. And I'm using the word community in the sense in which it's being used today. Care for the community, the wider community. And it's a very proper use of the word. But I'm also using it in the sense of the national community and indeed of the world community. Because you and I should be concerned about the world community. If we're Christians, and if we believe this gospel, yes, we believe in the particularity, but we also believe in the universality. Both are biblical, and we must always acknowledge that. And that's why it brings me then to my second John Calvin quote, which is really quite remarkable. And this is what he said. He's talking now about our understanding of the position of unbelievers. Those who are out there in the community, those who aren't Christian, our neighbours, colleagues, fellow students, other nations in the world. How do we view them from the perspective of this gospel? Well, let me give you an, an example from 
from John Calvin. He says here that we should be concerned generally for the wretched believers and the ignorant have great need to be pleaded for with God. Behold them on the way to perdition. If we saw a beast at the point of perishing, we would have pity on it. And what shall we do when we see souls in peril, which are so precious before God? And, he, and as he has shown in that he has ransomed them with the blood of his own son. If we see then a poor soul going thus to perdition, ought we not to be moved with compassion and kindness? And should we not desire God to apply the remedy? So then, St. Paul's meaning in this passage is not that we should let the wretched unbelievers alone without having any care for them. We should pray generally for all men. But he shows at the same time that we ought to have a special care for those whom God has joined to us by a tighter bond. And so on and so forth. You see what he's saying? Yes, we praise God for his mercy to his people. But this should overflow because God hasn't yet gathered in his church. So we should be concerned to look upon all our unbelieving neighbours. Jesus has died for them too. And we should live as those who have compassion upon them. Do we care? There's a lot about care, isn't there? The lack of care in many circumstances. But God forbid that there should be a lack of care in the hearts of those who believe this gospel. So I close with a couple of questions. Do we realise what we're into as Christians in the light of all this? Are we aware of the, the dire situation that we're in, which can only be remedied not by the politicians or the philosophers or the scientists, but can only be remedied by the gospel? The gospel which... Uh, it justifies us being excited about it. That's the important thing. So back again to Ephesians. What was wrong with the Ephesians? Well, again, it is a remarkable thing because in Ephesians 5 and verse 14, Paul seems to be charging them with being fast asleep. Look, Ephesians 5 14, therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, I find it hard to comprehend the state of that Ephesian church. Look what truth they had, had revealed to them. Look at the experience of Christ that they had professed, and yet perhaps were, uh, were beginning to lack. Uh, look at the example of the love of Christ set before them. Uh, here they were, what? Fast asleep. Isn't that the reason? You know, shame on me whenever I drift in this manner. Shame on you. Shame on all who name the name of Christ. We have the answer. So it's up for us to, to grasp the answer, to understand it, to, 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 to experience it, to be thrilled by it, to be amazed by it. Because nothing else will work in this troubled world. Nothing at all but this compassion of God in Christ. Compassion on the cross, compassion to the church, compassion to the community. So, my dear brothers and sisters, my final thoughts. May we wake up. May we have a renewed sense of loving urgency. May we be infused not with irrational enthusiasm, which is rather common in certain sections of the church, but a doctrinally based enthusiasm, filled with love, filled with love for the God who loves us, filled with love for Jesus who so loves us, filled with love for one another, filled with love for all the world, for Jesus' sake. I think this really is the message, the root message of the parable of the prodigal son. God shows such compassion to us. We have received and we continue to enjoy it. Well, let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's unashamedly and faithfully and courageously, buoyantly share it as widely as we possibly can. Amen.
Well, our final hymn is 113. Hymn 113. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Hymn 113. Please be seated. 